main thing you need is distribution. Like, and you want to get large amounts of distribution at the, at the lowest cost because everyone's just throwing money and marketing, 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 and you need it. It's a necessity. But if you, there's another route you can take and get huge amounts of distribution in fashion where it's lower margins and you don't have to pay for every conversion, take it. I feel nauseous, believe me. Never had a lot of sh come easy. Had to work hard, struggle just to be me. Had to rise up just so they could see me. Did what I had to do just to feed me. And what was left over, I put towards my dreaming. But the only thing in life that has meaning are the things you gotta work for, believe me. Take into your hands a plan, your own hands can land your own brand and damn. I feel like no one takes accountability. They want the credibility, convincingly unwilling to put in the What's going on everybody? Welcome to the Lambs to Lions podcast. Uh, this is very early days in this experience as far as going into conversations around business uh, motivation and I guess practical application when it comes to understanding business. And I've got a very special guest here, Zane. Uh, welcome. And I'd like to give you an opportunity to introduce yourself and who you are, what you do. First of all, man, thanks for having me. It's awesome to be on this podcast and this studio you've got epic. Thank you, man. I appreciate uh, it. I know it's not easy to build something this big and, you know, it requires a lot of investment and everything like that. And yeah, it's awesome, man. First of all, so thanks for having me. Appreciate Dude, it. Thank you very much. It's um, I think from like it's really cool getting other people in here that own businesses because they actually can kind of appreciate what goes into building business, and like especially having some form of brick and mortar. Um, in a world where you and I both work mostly online, it's like it's a huge it's a huge shift, and I think people the only people that work exclusively online start to realize like okay, this is a massive shift. Yeah, uh, it's it's really cool to like get people in that have like a similar understanding of like the concept and and I guess the growth strategies that are, that are required to go in different directions. So I appreciate that, man. But who are you? What do you do? And um, what what are your strengths in what you do? I don't even know. I was thinking about it the other day. I don't even know really how to describe myself at the moment. But I uh, I just I um at the moment I run a marketing agency called Lux Social. I wouldn't, I don't like using the word entrepreneur, but I, I'd say I'm a business owner. I'm a business owner so I can avoid working the nine to five so I can do what I want, have full creative freedom. But um, yeah, at the moment, I would say that uh, um, my fo main focus is building businesses, um, investing in as many businesses as I can. Um, but the main focus is like social, which is a digital marketing agency. We do content creation. We do obviously ads management. We do influencer marketing, influencer management. So um, that's where I'm at at the moment. And then when I'm not in the marketing agency, I'm looking at investing in other businesses and building those on the side and trying awesome. to acquire what I can. Yeah, that's awesome. Let's talk about Lux, Lux, uh, Lux Social. Yes. Yeah, Lux. Yep. Let's talk about Lux. What got you into the industry of like knowing that marketing and sales is potentially the way forward? So the, the reason I wanted to start Lux was because prior to Lux, I had a clothing brand called Emperor Apparel. That was acquired by Culture Kings back in late 2020. So from running a clothing brand and knowing, you know, all of the moving parts in a clothing brand, uh, how hard it is to manage all of those moving elements. You know, obviously with it, when you're running a clothing brand, you're doing the design of the products, you're doing marketing the brand, you're dealing with production, production timeframes, you're negotiating with manufacturers. There's all of these different moving parts. So what I did was it, as it started to grow, and uh and expand i realized that i couldn't have i couldn't be everywhere so i hired a marketing agency and lost about th close to thirty thousand dollars on ads management and that completely pissed me off yeah being there yeah yeah sure. yeah and i was like you know that that snapped me into gear and i was like right you need to be on top of every part of the business understand every part and prior to that, I was doing all the marketing and it was working. And then when I hired this agency, it went to shit, yeah. went downhill. So I took over all of the marketing again and that was my main focus. So when I sold Emperor, knowing what brands need, I was like, I'm going to start like an end-to-end -end agency that has everything covered. So if you want to start a brand and you haven't even, you know, from scratch, you can, we can do everything. We can do the branding, we can do the content creation, we can do the ads, we can do video production, everything. Like you can be completely hands off if you want, mm. or you can just take part in whatever elements you want. Well, I've seen the other side of that as I guess a client of of Lux. Yeah. With LTR, we um we kind of opted for that as we slowly went through the process of like just taking our hands off because I think that's one thing that like I think made you a bit unique in regards to the marketing agency side of things. You actually knew that 
business owners didn't want to be there and doing the things. Yeah. And like the only way you can figure that out is through experience. So at what point did you realize that you're like taking notes of all these problems or taking notes of potentially all the gaps that other marketing agencies weren't filling was the, was the time to do so, or was your actual avenue into creating business? Yeah. So in, into Lux, like where I, yeah, it was when I sold like the second day that it got announced that Emperor was sold. I started getting people calling me like, Hey, can you help us with marketing? Hey, we're launching this clothing brand. Hey, we're launching this um, commercial cleaning brand. We need to know how to get on social media. And it wasn't, I was literally going to take like a six month break. And then we had the lockdown. So I was just going to piss off to Europe for like six months. Yeah. But then we were locked down in Melbourne and it was like, you can't go 5Ks from your house. Yeah. You can't go to the shops. You can't go anywhere. So I was like, well, I might as well just, just work, open up my computer and, and then from there, um, I started doing marketing for a tech company that needed um, like a pitch deck put together for investment. Mm -hmm. They need to raise $7 million. So we put this pitch deck together and then I was sitting there and I was like, I don't know what to do next with my girlfriend. And she was like, why don't you just keep doing the marketing? Like you've got all these people calling you. And there's clearly a gap in the market. And there's a gap in the market. And you're always saying, you know, basically filling the gaps of what all of these, like the pain points that brands have. Why don't you just create Lux and do end to end? and just expand it we're in lockdown well you've got nothing to lose there's one thing that you said there as well like trying to drive in on pain points it's like pain points would have been at their highest throughout lockdown because people yep. start to realize the problems within their business because they was actually like they were looking at through a macro lens now yes. that like COVID and, and lockdown pretty much exposed so many businesses where they didn't where they didn't have systems where they didn't have capacity for growth or predictable growth even that's where it really hit them. And I think that's where a lot of the businesses that came through the other end of that, that's the only difference. They had the ability to go, okay, well, how can I create predictability out of something that's so volatile? And yep. you would have been in this position, correct me if I'm wrong, but with people in such amounts of pain, it's very easy to uncover the emotion and the core problem behind that. And like having experience that like no marketing agency is doing the option of end to end, whether it's like high end production or user generated content. And it's, you know, making it seamless trying to weave that narrative so that the actual prospect or the people purchasing the product actually get it and yeah. you can highlight yeah. that through pain in like in marketing you can highlight that pain very very easily it's probably the easiest way to start a business is like find a pain point find a gap and then cross populate and, and that's exactly what it was it was like find a pain point and i was talking to uh it was there was a young kid on my street and he was like walking past and he was like this is just completely off topic again but he was like, how do I get like a Mercedes or a Lambo or whatever? And I was like, you need to get in the business of solving problems. Yeah. That's where the money is. Find people's pain point, solve the problem. That's where the real money is. And like when I, all of my wealthy friends that are 40, $50 million plus in terms of wealth, they just solve problems and they're really good at it. Yep. And they're really good at going through businesses and going, that's where you're going wrong. This is me. You need to fix this. You're burning revenue here. Um, you need to do marketing here and they get huge amounts of money for it. So, um, but COVID, as you said, exposed so many people. There was a lot of people that were, um, you know, they were cruising on along for a little while. They didn't have like good production systems in place. They weren't really spending all that much on marketing. They were relying on like organic. And then when the pandemic hit, every business went online and every big business with huge budgets went online. And then the small businesses were essentially like competing for the crumbs yeah and you had jd sport going and going shit our, our fucking clothes are uh, our stores are shut let's just put seven million a month into advertising online let's eat that market yeah and and then in the product you you even like escape from like the clothing industry it's like you look at every market the big people the big people sitting at the top were like well fuck we've got to pivot and we can pivot with our wallet yeah right everyone else has to pivot with their fucking time and effort and it's like, unfortunately, money buys efficiency. And so you're just yes. like, cool. If they can, if they have $7 million to waste on an ad spend, it's like, well, not waste, but actually pump into an ad spend. It's like, how can you how can you compete? So probably leads into a really good question. Is like in a saturated market, how can people com compete? So now with, with everything being so saturated, you need to do things completely different in order to stand out. So what we found in COVID was prior to COVID, everything that you did in terms of marketing had to be super polished, right? It had to look cinematic. It had to be um, really polished. It had to look like it was a foot like a commercial with all the right models, hot people, perfect. But then TikTok blew up in the middle of the pandemic in 2020. And that completely reframed the way that people consume content. It was raw. 
it um it completely the algorithm pushed raw content, stupid content like we were talking about downstairs. Yeah. Uh, and it and it completely pushed that over polished. And I don't know whether you've experimented with TikTok that much, Not but yet. if you put like cinematic stuff up. Or you put raw stuff up, the raw stuff kills it. The only stuff that I've found that actually goes well that's cinematic if it's emotion driven. Yeah. So like if you can pull something that is cinematic. So for example, you and I are having a really good conversation. We put some like nice little like piano over it. Yeah. If it becomes shareable and you create content that people like actually get an emotional response from, you get a bit better of a crack at it. But like in comparison to what I've seen, like like I said, we haven't put a much we haven't put much effort into TikTok. But anytime that it's just like raw, cool, this is me at the gym, this is what I do, this is how I work, it's like it pops off really quickly. Yeah. And yeah. like, I think that's probably come from just being people, be, people being so bored and people being so overexposed during that time of COVID where they've just gotten used to like everything, everything sucks. Yeah. Like yeah. people had this mentality of like everything around them sucks. So like, why should my content be any different? Right. And now they've got this standard of lower standard of content actually means better. Yeah. It's like, how do we, like what we're doing at the moment through the agencies is the main priority is creating like user generated content that's mm. really raw um it's getting influencers so influencer marketing traditionally was you would send out a package to an influencer they would do a post or they would do like a video of themselves looking hot with the product yep. now it's like you send out product to the influencers then they have to do like a user generated content video where they talk about it they unbox it they talk about the product more it's lo-fi it's not overly produced you put that into ads and we've seen like there was some ads where it would be cinematic and it would be like eight ROAS. These are like a 30 or 20 and it's, it's like half the effort, but it's actually half the effort in production, but in planning and making it look organic and making it look native to the platform is a big effort. Yeah. Making it look like a TikTok video. So it, when people are scrolling, it looks like a regular TikTok that's a video. Really, that's an interesting thought process because if you think about like organic based content that does come naturally, when you then try and force that, it almost goes against the grain. Yeah. And you're like, if you're yeah. trying to create organic content, it's no longer organic. It's And people can see through it. Yeah. Subconsciously, they can see through it. They can see when things are overthought or, okay, this brand's realized that raw is the way and they try and do raw, but it just doesn't come off right. It's hard to get that balance. Mm. Um, that's why the women's beauty brands do it really well. How so? So they, they most of the time, girls are just better at filming content. Um, their the way they edit their videos and and you know the just got a better eye a better eye for it just a better eye yeah. it's a much better eye and they're faster at it and they're much better at creating that organic content that looks native to TikTok the reels are really raw the color grading's light mm -hmm. you know it's vibrant and they're just better at doing that um, so what we find is to get that we have to send a really strict brief okay around to do this say this. Film these um, eight frames. So film a bit of B-roll, film yourself talking about it. Um, then transition into, you know, a couple of flat lays of the product, you using it, talk about it out. Yeah. So it's that right. level of specificity that's actually required to create somewhat organic content. So, yeah. So why, for everyone at home, I want to really, I want to circle back to something that you said, it's a 30 ROAS. Can you give that a very layman's term expl explanation of what a 30 ROAS is? Yeah, so 30 ROAS is like basically a return on your ad spend. So for every dollar you put in, you get 30 back. That's insane. It's hard to it's it's hard to get. Yeah. Um, I don't care what other agencies say. You, you, you'll you scroll your feed and you'll see a million and one agencies going, we'll get you 30 ROAS, we'll get you 50, we'll get you 40. And then I've had mates that have gone with those agencies and they get one. Yep. So the big brands don't care if they get one. So Boohoo, if they get one, they acquire that customer. They know they're going to come back three to six times, 10 times. Mm -hmm. So if they spend $50 to acquire a customer, so that means you spend $50 for that customer to purchase and you only make 50 back, they're like, sweet. We've got them in the net. We'll retarget yeah, them. Yeah, we can cast a very wide net and know that they're going to be hit in some way, shape or form, whether it be like an emotional response, like a FOMO response, or it's like a status play. At some point, they're going to get them. Yeah, they'll get them. Smaller that brands don't have that luxury though. But when you're a smaller brand, you need to get that cost of acquisition, acquisition down as low as possible. Mm -hmm. and, and most brands are like, what can you afford to, you know, if, if it costs you $15 for a product, you know, you want to be down at that $7 to get them so that then by the time you double the cost of that product, you're making some sort of profit. Yeah. So to get 30 is, is really good. I don't care what anyone says. That, that for me is awesome. Yep. If we can get someone 30, that's really good with how competitive it is. Uh, most of the time we'll get anywhere like the average is about 15 okay. on new brands. Yep. So if it's Corona, much easier. Yeah. 
the branding's been done. They've been around for years. And the status is there. And the, the status brand, is there. The brand built. recognition, the brand equity is all there. So it's like the ability for people to do, like you could throw, it's almost, you look at like Apple, right? Apple have such a great, great and strong brand. They don't need to advertise. They can literally just put a white screen in the word Apple and people will buy. Yeah. Right? So like, for, yeah. like big ass brands like Corona, it's not, it's not necessarily compatible or relatable to the smaller brands. And like, I think that's something that you said there is like the cost of acquisition, but also like looking at lifetime value. Most of the time, bigger brands, and I can I can speak to this when it comes to like people that within our business. I'm also I'm way more concerned of what they will pay us over time rather than what they pay us initially. So like trying to improve that LTV. Is there anything that you found that can actually improve LTV for like smaller brands? Yeah. So a lot of it's when you look at lifetime value for say a clothing brand, it normally comes down to uh, like the value you bring in them. Obviously, it's the hype on the brand. So if if you're constantly getting new people in. You know, say, for example, with Emperor, fitness influencers, DJs. Um, uh, we used to use like uh, fashion influencers as well. I'd try and get it on as many music artists as I could. So if that kept popping up, then those people that had purchased beforehand would purchase again because they're like, now this person's wearing it. I'll purchase the next season. This person's wearing it now. Now it's in Culture Kings. Now it's in um, uh, Live. Now it's in all of these different places. So that was the way I increased that rather than using like online strategies, it was like, just put it on everyone, get it everywhere. And then the more they see it, the more they'll come back. Yeah. How much do you think like a buying rate or like a a buying to a brand really comes back to just like social recognition and status? I think it's everything now, especially because you've got rappers that will drop a a clothing line that's absolute trash and it'll make $3 million in a night. And people are only buying that trash because it's on a wrapper. They're only buying that. They know it's a triple A t-shirt with a print on it because ASAP Rocky drops it. And I'm not saying his brand's trash, by the way. I'm just saying that they can drop whatever they want based on their personal brand and their status. So, you know, High Smile, they were competing against, say, Oral-B, Colgate, all of these huge brands that have been around for years. But their strategy was bring in the bulk production and get everyone using it build the status, build that social recognition and that credibility with every single influencer in Australia. And then from there, people are like, well, if I'm thinking about whitening, I need a smile. Yeah, they're the only people that come to mind. The only option. Yeah. Yeah. What's like, I want to really kind of hit this home for everyone that like, where did you start? Where did all this come from? Because like, you were not always the guy that sold a clothing company to one of the biggest distributors of clothing in Australia. Yeah. Like you were not always that guy. So how did it happen? So I, if I go right, right back, I, I, my first job was in a surf shop. Pen- shout out to Peninsula Surf <laughs> in Mornington. They gave me my first job. I loved that because I could be around surfboards all day. Yeah. I had mad fashion. I could get wicked discounts on Dude, me and Billabong you. t-shirts. Me and you were the same. <laughs> yeah. I was, uh, my first job was a surf, surf shop as well. And it was just like 45% yeah. staff discount. Thank you. It was the best. Like, and I spent all my wage on clothes. And if it wasn't on clothes, it was on a wetsuit, it was on a new surfboard and, and I love that. But that, that was a really good job because it taught me about sales and it got me outside of my family network and dealing with different people. And it was where I experienced like people being rude yeah, and not wanting a bar of me. So I'd be like, hey, and they'd be like, fuck off. Yeah. And I was like, what? There's a lot to be learned from people saying fuck off. Oh, huge. Like the ability to handle rejection, not in just like business, but in life, if you can actually start to get high end rejection in like where, where money is on the, t- on the table, even if it is for a Billabong t-shirt that's 60 bucks. Yep. If you get rejected for that, like learning how to actually combat that is fucking, a valuable skill. It was so valuable. Like, and I talk about this with my mom all the time. It's like, at one point I was like, I don't really know what I want to do with my life. And I'm working in this surf shop and I'm about to finish school and I didn't know what I wanted to do. And she was like, look, this is the means to, to an end. And you'll, you'll look back on this one day and there'll be so many lessons in this job that you'll look back on and go, oh, that helped me here, that helped me there. And that job really helped me with sale, like my introduction to sales, networking, and um, and just learning how to deal with different personalities. It's looking for the silver lining, right? Yeah. Like if, if you can put yourself in a position where not just every job, but every experience, every encounter you have every on a daily basis and start to look for the learning, like start to look yeah. for the lesson and the silver lining within that. Like I know for me, like there's so many mundane experiences that I've had in my life that I look back and go, oh, that actually taught me this and that's how I apply it now in business. And, you know, just even the simple thing of like showing someone curiosity, right? Curiosity is something that I use in sales all the time. Is like, oh, tell me about that. Like, why not? Right. Yeah. Rather than aggression and be like, oh, you're wrong. Like just learning how to be curious. That's come from like very mundane encounters with like my nephew, right? 
just learning about why he does stuff. It's like, I think if you can actually really, I think I'm a little bit off topic, but I think building any business is just about trying to draw experience from all of what you've done. Yeah, and like sure. small things like working in a surf shop actually go a very long way. Yeah, they do. They do. And like you said, every, when I look at everything I've done, it's the same. I'll look back and I'll go, that was for a reason. And even like really hard times, like really hard times, I look back and I look at even like 2020, how much that hardened me up because I had to fight to fight that whole year. And I had to become better at sales. I had to become better at negotiating. I had to be more strategic. I had to be harsher. I had to, I had to become stronger again. And, and, you know, all of these different things I learned in that. And when I look back, I was like, man, that sucked. That was the shittest year. But now I look back and I go, fuck, that made me really strong and aggressive yeah. that year. Dude, it's like, I'm pretty sure it's Steve Jobs said, like, you only know what made you when, when you, once you look back in hindsight. Yeah. It's like, you can look back at like two or three moments and go, oh, that was it. That was the point where I was like, I had a fucking change. I, I was, I got the skill set, I got the strength and I was resilient. Like it doesn't come from just medial progressions of like positivity. Yeah. Like, positivity does shit. Yeah. Like for me, I know that every time that like the business has grown and not just like normal predictable growth, but has gone absolutely parabolic, has gone from a place where I've been like back, back up against the wall and it's like, yeah. kick the fucking thing down and let's go. Yeah. 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 It's always that. So what was your what was your kick your kick the door in moment like you left the surf shop and then what Yeah so I didn't know what I wanted to do and my dad was like oh you know why don't you look at getting into a trade you know you can make some good cash there and then you know you can once you get qualified you can use that cash to build whatever you want So I was an electrician for about 6 years I went through my apprenticeship hated every single millisecond of it like hated it but i was like i'll just go through this and i don't know to be honest i don't know why i stayed it in, in that job i hated it do you regret it Do you regret staying for as long as you did no because i wouldn't have been able to build emperor without that elect electrical job because when i became qualified i then got a job at a commercial company called klm that was good money we'd do night shift i just saved every cent i'm like it was like i was someone saving to get out of jail did you know what you were saving for yeah i knew i wanted to start a clothing brand it was always in the back of my mind. And I used to tell like the old guys, I'm like, I'm not going to be here long. <laughs> you were that guy? Yeah, I was that annoying guy. And they're like, piss off saying, just do the switchboard. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I was like, I'm getting out of here. I'm doing every Saturday, Sunday, whatever it is to save as much money as I can. And I'm getting out of here. It was like I was the rapper trying to get out of the hood and into like Los Angeles. I don't know what it was. It was just this, I had this grit to get out and I saved every cent. And then from there, I saved up about $150,000 and I used that money to start Emperor. So that meant that I could buy the stock. I could invest in marketing. I could invest in good quality ads, mad images, all of that, which made the brand sort of grow a lot faster than other streetwear brands at the time. I think quality, like especially back then, quality went a very long way. Like it, it was worth the investment to put more into, you know, high quality images, good photography, good marketing and so on because it was so disruptive. Yeah, people yeah. weren't used to it, especially on a startup. People are used for used to a startup just coming in and setting the bar low and yeah. like slowly growing. But if you come in and like, you know, like it's like the same fake to make it. Like if you come in like a big guy, right? If you come in like we've got high in production, we've got high in product, like automatically value becomes like perceived value goes through the roof. Yeah. Yep. And it was like that because I remember saying to the photographer at the time, I need this to look like a Gucci ad. Like, and I was sending him like Gucci, Louis Vuitton, all of these big high-end brands as like inspiration. What was the thought process to going for like, if we look at fashion now, like and in startup fashion, it's not often like high-end. Yeah. What was the, because like, if we look at where this is now positioned within Culture Kings, it's still positioning Culture Kings as a more premium brand. Yeah. 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 Right. Like it's, it, I think, look, granted, everything Culture Kings does give that, give off that vibe. But I feel like as far as Emperor, as far as the design, as far as everything there, it's like, it is specific and directive to being high-end yeah yeah and that seems like it's been on purpose it was on purpose so, um, why? so at, at, the, at the time I, I was always obsessed with luxury brands and to be honest with you they were too short for me they're made for short people, yeah, yeah, yeah short yeah. europeans yeah. like and i i would i would try stuff on and it just wouldn't fit and even like Ralph Lauren and Tommy Hilfiger and all of that, I can't wear that stuff. It's too short. Dude, I, it's too short and also everything's way too tight for me. Yeah. Like, yeah, I, like no way. it just doesn't work. Dude, I roll around in my Target flannies now because it's the only thing that fucking fits. Yeah, yeah. So, so that, that so that's the thing. And all of my mates have played footy 
they were like lean and jacked and quite tall. And they were like, oh, I can't find any clothes that fit. And everyone was pulling their T-shirts down all the time. We'd be in the club and pulling our T-shirts down and going, this is bullshit. Like, how can we not have T-shirts that fit us? So I started, um, interesting story, why I started Empro. I was actually in the Greek islands and I was on a trip away from the electrical job. And it completely, I don't know what happened. I, I walked through um, where all the mega yachts were docked in Mykonos and it was like a walk through something. Man, I, I, I'm, I've been there. Yeah. I've been there and yeah. I'm, I'm picturing it and it's wild. Yeah. And it was like, I had a state change. I like walked through and I was looking at the mega yachts and then there was this guy, it was a gigantic one. And I, was, I remember saying to my girlfriend at the time, how did, like, that's how 120 that million. Yeah. yeah. How, and, and how does that money exist? But then how does one person get enough money to buy that yacht. You're talking about 120, 130 million dollars for this thing. It was white and gold and he was just watching Wimbledon. I remember it. He was just sitting there with a champagne. There's I actually read something pretty pretty similar to this a couple of days ago and it's very very powerful when it comes to actually changing your perspective on money and what's achievable. So what we've done recently in the business is we've shifted to a high ticket model where it's all paid in full, right? And there was initially a limiting belief for me where it was like people won't pay that, right? And what I had to realize is people fucking pay $150,000 for a pen. Like there are people that pay 150 grand for a fucking pen, yeah. right? So I, what I read the other day is if you ever have a problem with money, if you ever have a problem with like a concept of what people will pay, you start reading the Rob Report, right? And the Rob Report is just full of chairs that are worth 200K, pens that are worth 150K. It's like you're not seeing your ads for Mercedes, you're seeing ads for fucking Rolls Royce. And yeah. it's like, you start to realize like, well, if someone will pay that, why the fuck will they not pay me for something more valuable than a pen? Yeah. Right? And it's the same concept. You walking yeah. through those super yachts, it's like, oh, this exists. Like exposure is one of the biggest parts to actually creating success. Because if you aren't exposed to it, it's like, you know, the um, when people always say like, you are the sum of the five people you, you spend yeah. most time with. Like if the most the people you spend most time with are poor, right? And objectively have no money. Like, okay, what you believe to be actually achievable is going to be pretty limited. Yeah, especially if that's their, fil they're, they're sharing their filters with you too on what's possible. <laughs> yeah, 100%. So when you go to Greece, and you stand there at Mykonos and you look at a yacht and you ask that, like I'd said, what do you do? Oh, you asked him? Yeah. Dude. So he came out on the, on the back of it and he had a cigar yeah. and he was having a cigar and he was having a break from watching Wimbledon. And I just walked up and I was like, what do you do for a living, man? Like, didn't care what I look like. And he goes, um, I'm in finance and I invest in businesses and I'm part of a big private equity firm. And I was like, okay. <laughs> I remember going back on my phone, private equity. <laughs> <laughs> what is that? <laughs> yeah. What's private equity? Yeah. And then I learned about that. And then what that did was it just, I don't know what happened. It just expanded my scope. And in that moment, I remember looking and I was like, I'm going to go home and I'm going to start that clothing brand. And I'm going to get it into Culture Kings and I'm going to sell it online and I'm going to try and get it into every big retailer within Australia first. Was that the plan initially, sell to Culture Kings? It wasn't sell the company to Culture Kings. It was just get it in there. Cool. So that was actually a plan that if you, if you were to, in retrospect, go like, cool, I had a business model. The business model and the plan of action was get this to be sold in high-end retail. Yeah. And I remember I got home from the Greek islands. I stood in front of my mom and dad and I was like, I'm quitting my electrical job and I'm going to start this clothing brand. I'm going to get it into Culture Kings and I'm going to sell it online throughout Australia and I'm going to try and bust America as well. But I, I had it in stages. Sell online, build up the credibility, then hit Culture Kings, show them the Shopify sales and say, hey, we're doing this. You know, I proved to them that there was we had a brand that worked and that it was selling and that it had credibility. And then, hey, let's get it in store and see what we can really do. What I'm curious, what was the decision or what? Look, in, in retrospect, again, hindsight, it, it was clearly successful. It worked, right? You built the business to a large sum, was able to, to on sell it to a, a, the largest distributor of clothing, like clothing in, in Australia at the least. Yep. Why did you see that to be the answer? Because I knew to sell large quantities and get it out there, I needed distribution. All of my mates that were in business, they said the main thing you need is distribution. Like, and you want to get large amounts of distribution at the, at the lowest cost because everyone's just throwing money and marketing, 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 and you need it. It's a necessity. But if you, there's another route you can take and get huge amounts of distribution in fashion where it's lower margins and you don't have to pay for every conversion, take it. Remove the risk. Yeah, remove the risk. And then not only that, you're attaching Culture King's credibility to your brand. You're attaching uh, a large, as you said, distributor. If they trust you, that brand's cool. So if you can't attach it to a wrapper, attach it to the like the biggest retailer you can, and that was that was always my thing. Was your was your initially like aim high, like because like Culture Kings is a fucking high target, yeah, yeah. Like yeah. was that the initial target, like and yeah. why, like why did you see the 
I guess the answer to be aim high and maybe potentially miss than rather aim low and hit. Because like you could have gone for a lower distributor. Yeah, yeah. I think it's that, it sounds super corny, but you know that shoot for the moon and if you, you miss, you hit the stars. Yeah. It was just kind of like that. If you just go big early and, and you're always going to, if you go for Culture Kings and you build a brand and you build a brand that you want to be in every high-end retailer in Australia, you're going to end up buying, like building something that at the very least, it's going to sell a heap online and then other retailers that are maybe half the size will pick it up. And that ended up happening as well. So along the way, it didn't go into Culture Kings first. It went into about 30 retailers first. And then when I, everything was gathering data so that I could eventually show them we've got sales, we have retailers, we have influencers wearing it, we have the same influencers wearing it, we shoot the same as you. Yeah. It fits. It's proof. Yeah, you're, yeah, and you're creating future proof and reducing risk on their end because, like, let's not like I guess beat around it. It's like that's an investment for them, right? It's an investment for them on time, money, effort, yeah. brand, everything, right? Yeah. And it's a huge risk to take on. Will you still con- we would would you still have considered yourself a startup when you got yeah, taken on by very them? much so? Yeah. yeah, yeah. I remember. So I called the owner of Culture Kings every single week for a year before I got a meeting. So I would, I, I got, okay, so this is the thing. Initially, I was, I'd go into Culture Kings all the time and I knew a lot of their crew in Melbourne and Sydney. And I was living in Sydney at the time. And uh, I won't say who because you'll get in trouble for forwarding the email address. But one of their crew was like, hey, you need to email the owner. Yeah. Here's his email address. Yeah. And I was like, okay, sweet. So I emailed him, no reply, dead, which yeah. always happened. So I emailed him again. And then I just made it so I'd email a couple of times a week. And then he replied and had his number on the signature. Yeah. So he was like, yeah, it's dope, but we've got like heaps of dope brands. So, you know. Call me back. We, Pretty much call me back when you're a big fish kind of deal. Yeah. It was just, he was, and he does, you know, he's running this huge multi million dollar business. It was rapidly expanding. And he was just like, yeah, it's dope, but um, yeah, we've got heaps of dope brands. That was the first response. And I was like, you know, we're doing all these sales and stuff and um, we're selling throughout Australia. You know, in Sydney alone, we're selling this amount. And he was like, yeah, yeah, cool. Call me back. Yeah. Like whenever I'm busy. i got little Yachty coming into the store. And- there's, there's something to be learned from the simple word of but because everything that comes before it doesn't mean shit. Yeah. Yeah. And that's NLP. Yeah. Yeah. Hey everyone, what's going on? Hope you're well. I won't keep you too long because hopefully we're doing a really good job and providing you some value. And if we are, it would be a great, great favor for me and we would appreciate massively if you could leave us a five-star review, like, comment, or subscribe if you're on YouTube. If you're on Spotify, you don't even need to stop listening. It's very, very easy to just give us a five-star review. It takes less than 10 seconds and it helps the channel move forward and it helps our message grow tremendously. And as I said, I would appreciate it greatly. Again, I don't want to keep you too long. One last thing. If you do want to take this one step further and help push our message and help spread the word of Lambs to Lions, you can do us another favor. You can just simply put up a post of you listening or consuming our content in any way. Share it to your stories, tag us, and we're going to be picking one winner every single week to win some apparel and potentially guest spot on the podcast themselves to highlight their business and what they've got going on in the world. We do appreciate it. And again, thank you so much for listening. And if you could leave us a review, again, massively appreciated. Back to the show. Like 100% it is. It's like everything that comes before before but means nothing. So it even comes to like, you know, I talk about this with my team all the time. It's like, if you say all the negatives first and then go, but we will get the results. Like the, everything that happens after the, but is the thing that people listen to. Yeah. So if yeah. you got given that, yeah, it's dope, but everything after that is just like, oh fuck. Yeah. And I, and you can hear it in their voice if someone's psyched. And then anyway, so I kept chipping away and I kept building the brand and I kept doing stuff. And I, he said at that time, he did say, kept me in the loop though. So I knew I had my foot in the door. And my thing is if my foot is in the door and I've got it wedged, I'm going to crack it open. I don't care how long it takes. I will keep I will keep punching that door until I get it open. And the one thing he says to me all the time is he goes, you are the most persistent person I've ever come across. Where does that persistence and resilience come from? I just wanted to make it big. I didn't want to go back to being an electrician again. Okay, why though? Um, because... Because like, let's devil's advocate, what's wrong with being an electrician? Nothing. And I want to make that really clear. I have never made easier money than when I was an electrician. I mean that there is nothing wrong with that. It's just, I'm a creative person. So when I'm not designing and I'm not doing something artistic or creative, um, it wears me down. And I could have, I say this all the time. I could have stayed as an electrician. 
I probably could have bought three investment properties right now. I'd have like zero stress. I could rock up to work every day with like nowhere near as much responsibility as I have Sounds now. Hundred percent. Yeah, man. I I talk to the I talk to to Pat about this all the time. I was like, I could never do a normal job, although a normal job would be easier. Yeah, like running a business is, it has its stresses that I don't think come with a nine to five. The security that comes with a nine to five, the opportunity to just switch off, all that kind of stuff. But why did you not want that? Yeah, I don't know. I just always wanted more, and I wanted freedom. I remember going, like being on site, and I'd have to ask one of the angry formers like hey can i have five days off mm. and they'd be like no i'm like is this what my life's going to be like like am i just going to have to ask for permission for everything to, for, for like a day off or um i remember i was modeling at the time and i was like hey um maya wants me to model can i have a day off and they were like no if you take a day off you're fired fuck and i was like but it's maya it's a, that's like the opportunity of opportunities yeah and i remember i said i can't come in and my agent went what do you mean you can't come in this is maya and I was like, I can't come in. My boss won't let me. And she's like, just quit. Yeah, it's Maya. Yeah, she's like, it's Maya. <laughs> Did you quit? No, oh, I didn't do the same. job. And, and then she fired me. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. <laughs> yeah, and then she fired me. And then the owner of Maya was like, oh, not the owner of Maya, sorry. Whoever was doing the castings was like, that guy's never come back again. Oh, so you got burnt. I got blacklisted. Yeah. And, um, and then that was what stung. I was like, you know, what opportunities did I miss there that, that, I, that I could have taken? But- that, that was a self-worth thing at that time as well. Mm -hmm. That's what I'd bring it down to. Like maybe then if I was as confident as I was now, I'd be like, it doesn't matter. I'll make money somewhere else. Yeah. I think that's something that like, probably for me, one of the biggest lessons I've got from business is just like, I'm not scared of money now. As in, But more to the point of like, I'm not scared because I know I'll always be able to make more. Yeah. yeah. Like it's like if something happened, if something went wrong, it's like, I'm not scared to spend money because I know I'm always going to get it back. And I don't mean that in an unhealthy way where I just go buy all this dumb shit. But like, if it's for growth of business, I'm like, okay, let's go, yeah. right? And like, I don't think I would have had that skill set because like for me, like I grew up in like a household that was just like average. Like we weren't below the line, we weren't above the line. Mum and dad never had really high paying jobs. So like relationship with money was very like scarcity. Yeah, there, was scarcity. A, there was a sense of scarcity of like, cool, we have to you know, budget, we have to save and that's all valuable skill sets. But I would have, had I not gotten into business, I would have been in this process of like, fuck, I can't spend it. Yeah really worried that I won't get it back. And it's probably the same goes for you when it comes to like quitting a job that you hated. Like, yeah. How, did you hate it at that point? I didn't hate it. I like, I loved the social side of, I, I had a lot of friends that I worked with there that we'd have a lot of laughs with. Yeah. Um, but I did, I remember, I know this sounds really dark, but I remember at the time I knew I had to quit. I remember we were working on a particular job and I remember I looked over the edge and it wasn't suicidal or anything, but I was like, if I just like fell and broke my ankle, I'd be able to like have time off work guilt-free. And then I was like, or I could just take time off. Yeah, there's that. Yeah. There was that, but I was just like, I had this thing where I was like, oh, I was glued to this job and this identity and, oh, this is all I'm ever going to be. Then when I was in the Greek islands, that went, that was where it just, my mindset completely changed. And I was like, you're not limited to living in one country. You're not limited to one job. You can do multiple things. You're capable of more. And I came back with a completely different mindset. And I know it sounds like one of those influencer chicks, I went away to Byron Bay and I came back and I realized that, you know, I'm from a free spirit. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't any of that. It was just like, I just saw huge amounts of wealth in Italy, in, in Greece. Um, I saw people just cruising around in Rolls Royces on a Thursday and getting out and going for lunch. And I was like, I want to do that. How do you do that? How do you just step off a yacht on a Tuesday with a champagne in your hand and jump in the water? It's like the difference between accruing wealth and just being and having money because yeah. like having money is not enough yeah. like having money is never going to buy you the opportunity to just not work ever like yeah. having wealth will yeah yeah having wealth will and even like the richest people i know there's a lot of guys i know that could retire now and just chill but for some reason they keep hammering yeah i think it's one of those things that the, the goalpost always moves yeah yeah like you know how they say like opportunity is a moving target and like once it's in front of you you have to take it yeah. So they probably see that there's this opportunity that's still there that they're just trying to hit. And yeah. Like once they've capitalized on it, they'll stop. But the problem is with people that are in that, I guess, entrepreneurial mindset is there, there's always another target. There's always another opportunity. Yeah. But like yeah. you said there that the owner of Culture King said you were the most persistent, resilient dude. Yeah. Was that built from the process of building Emperor to that point? Because like there's something to be said of like, yeah, okay, Culture King's helped grow it and help make it go, kind of go parabolic. But there was, 
like it was already in 30 retailers before then. Yeah. It had yeah. already sold online. It had already built up some sort of brand. So yeah. did that skill set come from that time of like, I'd, I'd assume a shit ton of failures? Yeah. And just um, tons of rejection. So the word no just didn't really hold any weight with me anymore. Mm -hmm. Previous to that, if people said no, I was like, oh, we're off. Yep. But over time, when you build a business, it's like you get a no and you're like, well, I need to find a way to get a yes or I need to get a, I need to get a meeting somehow. Um, so you find different ways around how to do that, whether you increase the value of your product, whether you make your brand better, whether you um, become better at sales, whether you become better at communicating your message and what it is and why it's better and why, it's, why you should take this brand instead of um, Carhartt or, or um, another more established brand. So I think up until then, I'd had a lot of no's with even other retailers. They were like, nah, nah, we've already got a lot of brands. Nah, we can't allocate a new brand. Universal Store was like, nah, in order to take on your brand, we need to kill two others and we're not prepared to do that. So what a lot of people don't realize is when you get into a big retailer, they have to either um, make an allocation in their budget to take on a new brand or they have to drop one or two to take yours. Yeah. And a lot of the time they're not prepared to drop those other two that are already generating revenue. Because when you wholesale, you click into their revenue. And then they rely on you every month or every quarter. So they, yeah. they project, they, you're part of their projections, right? We're going to sell this amount of LTL. We're going to sell this amount of Emperor. We're going to sell this amount of St. Mortar. So, um, yeah, you click into the system. So It's it, a far larger risk than that initial investment to buy it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So that's what you're fighting against in fashion. I don't know about other, I know it's the same in the beauty industry as well. If you want to get into Sephora, it's like, well, wow how good is your brand? We'll make an allocation for it. But if it's not good, then we're not going to, we'll spend 80 grand on marketing instead. Yeah. yeah. Rather than 80 grand on a new beauty brand. Well, it, like, I think that comes back down to pre predictability. Like that's where you now, like within Lux, that, that's where you make your business. That's where you make a business is creating predictable revenue. Yeah. Yeah. So like if you yeah, think about exactly this, right. any opportunity in business, like the more predictable, the more highly it will be leveraged. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And that's why um, online brands are so powerful because when you get it right and, and you get all your marketing right, you get the creative right, it then becomes just a machine where the more you put in, the more comes out. So that's when the retailers start knocking and going, hey, if we were to just put 3 million into that, we could turn that into 10 or 12. Yeah, because they, they plug that into their brand equity and their system and it's like, yeah. fuck, yeah. shut the gates. Yeah, and when Sephora attaches their name to a beauty brand and that beauty brand's already cranking, and that person's spending 200K and they're making 3 million. Sephora's like, why don't we just put 10 into it and send it? Yeah. So what, like now that you've gone through that experience, what are some of the take-home points to actually build a brand that the bigger brands actually care about? I hate to say, it's just money. It's money and sales. That's what, and margin. Okay. So this is why I'm, you know, I piss a lot of people off all the time. They talk about sustainable fashion. Is your brand sustainable? Mm-hmm. Um, retailers don't care about that yeah they care about top line they care about margin yeah can we make 60 or 70 percent i want my brand sustainable we don't care we're not going to take it on if, if if the cost of it's too expensive and they go down to 55 or 50 they don't want it they want 60 and 70 percent yeah this is a oh man this, i could go on a fucking rant on this because this is where like people get into this thought process of what the world could be or what the world should be and they forget about what the fuck it is yeah it's like you are here this is what we deal with and this is the norm Right. And this is where people, this is the accepted standard of we want to make X. If your product comes in higher and more expensive, but it has a more sustainable, um, I guess, sourcing process. It, yeah. Cool. It'd be great. It'd be all sunshine and rainbows if the great, if the world could be all su uh, sustainable and all amazing for everybody, but it's just not. It's like yeah. the, the sooner businesses can actually adapt to what's actually in front of them, what's here now, rather than trying to, potentially future proof because yeah future proof is great when it comes to like cash flow and trying to make decisions but when it comes to future proofing a product that the the market hasn't accepted yet be prepared not to make money yeah yeah and i had this argument there was um i we were doing marketing for ego mm -hmm. expo yep and uh i put out a video about um sustainability and how it just no one gives a shit about it yeah. in terms of, in terms of, I don't want to call out any retailers. Or but in terms of into, top line. In like, terms of top line, no yeah, one cares. Yeah. We need to make 60% margin minimum to make money. Can you match that or not? 
And there was like a, a lady, she runs a fashion sustainability course at a particular uni. Mm-hmm. And she was like, you're part of the problem. We need to have more sustainability. Brands need to slow down and and they need to focus on not so much large amounts of quantities and fast fashion. They need to slow down and 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 be more sustainable. And I was like, and how do you make money in that process? Yeah. Because fashion's all about volume. And anyone that is in fashion knows money is in the volume. So this chick standing up at a university teaching students about you need to slow down, do less quantities and make it more sustainable. You're teaching people how to be broke and people like us are going to stomp them. It's as simple as that. And the big retailers, if we're stomping them, the big retailers are just liquefying them. And these these girls coming out and guys and, um, oh, I'm creating this new brand. It's super sustainable and blah, blah, blah. It's a buzzword. It's a buzzword. No one cares about it. Yeah. And it, like, <laughs> this is where, if we want to look at this in a more larger scale as well, right? Here we go. This is the funny part because you create a sustainable brand that doesn't turn over as, not, as much revenue. So it's worse for the economy. So it starts to impact everyone on a larger scale more negatively. Right? Yeah. More money made for you means more money made everywhere, which means it's a fucking good thing. Yeah. Right. Especially in what's happened in the last two years, the more money we make as a country, the better. Yeah. Right? And we need more money. Yeah from this country and we need this is why i always say i'm passionate about building australian brands because all of our money goes overseas especially in fashion a lot of it it goes to american brands it goes to european brands it goes to brands in the uk because australians what i feel is they don't support australians yeah they yeah. support americans when you look at even reality tv shows love island uk goes off the australian one does nothing the australian one tanks yeah in comparison but then when you look at the australian following on love island uk it's huge Mm -hmm. and they all get behind it and we all dress like we're from the uk we all get my fades dead at the moment but yeah yeah, we get out you get your cropped hairline you get this and that it's all it's all uk inspired 100 it's all uk inspired and we used to talk about it with ltl and like um a lot of ea was uk inspired the the spray jeans um you know the fit of the t-shirts we had like almost like uk section and then the australian section and then one that I would, you know, more oversized version that we sort of target America with that did a lot better. But that, so, but that's just knowing your market too, right? Because this yeah. is where, again, we can we can sit here and argue forever about what it could be, what it should be, but what it is is really what matters, and that's where it's going to make money. If like yeah. people want a UK inspired fashion brand, you'd be stupid not to make a UK inspired line within your brand that then they can come in and upsell and buy all of the other stuff. Yeah, and it's like it's just trying to create like. If that's where people are willing to spend money, you've either got one, or you've got a couple of ways to kind of, I guess, pull them back to your brand. One is to conform to what they're already used to, right? So show them value where they already see it. Or two, diversify the market so much and, and bank on the 50% that will love you, will buy it, and the 50% will hate you, will fucking tell everyone that they hate you, but you get more brand recognition anyway. Yeah, yeah. They're still doing the same amount of promotion when, when they're telling, you whether, telling people whether they hate the brand or not. And like Hera went through that. Yep. You know, they have people that love them and then they had haters because it, Ash blew that brand up and he used influencers and he went a, totally against um, every other brand's come up and it exploded. Yeah. But it had a lot of haters as well. And most of those haters were from the industry. It wasn't from consumers. Yeah, because it's uh, where does hate come from most times? Uh, insecurity or fear? Always. Ego is insecurity. It always is. I learned that. Mm. I had a massive ego. But it was, it was just like, I need to show everyone that I'm capable of building a business. I need to show people that, um, I need to show all, <laughs> so stupid. I was motivated by a principal that told me I was a loser. Oh, dude, me too. It wasn't and a principal, like, but it was like four teachers. Like I didn't finish school. Yeah. Right. Like I, I didn't do my exams and I pulled the pin and like, man, the amount of teachers told me like, you'll be nothing. Literally those words, like you'll be nothing. Yeah. If you don't do these exams, like, man, that, that used to fuel me. Up until probably three years ago, that was the reason that I got up. That was the reason that I was like, I've got to build this to a thing that's seven figures. That was like, that was the thing. Did you then find that that was a toxic type of oh, motivation though? That knows. actually starts to grind you down? Yeah. yeah. Because like once when you start to compare yourself, or what I found at least, when I started to compare myself to the standard that was set when I was a fucking 17 year old, one, I didn't have an emotional grasp on the world. And two, I didn't understand what it took to actually feel successful or feel fulfilled yeah and so where there's this always this underlying sense of like under fulfillment or i've not achieved what i thought i would always come back to this one teacher be like you'd be nothing and it's like well fuck define nothing yeah because i was putting the word nothing up on this pedestal of like i needed to have this car i needed to have this house i needed to have this bank account i needed to have blah 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 yeah but it, it said nothing about how i actually felt about what i was doing and there was a period of time where i hated what i did yeah right and the business yeah. just like absolutely drained the fucking life out of me yeah. I think everyone goes through that point of business. No one yeah. was killing them though. Oh, for sure. 
like the ups and downs of business are brutal when you talk about resilience and like um, that going back to that persistence mm. and why you keep pushing. It's because you get smashed down so many times where it, it doesn't matter whether it's someone, something someone said or it's a rejection or it's production going wrong or um, delays on something. There's things that wear you down that make you naturally stronger and they make you more resilient. And like when I think about with a lot of people that I speak to on a daily basis, I find their problems are completely different to mine. Like I can't, I'm like, why are you worried about that? That's so small. Yeah. Like that wouldn't – and I don't want to sound like a dickhead, but I'm just like the shit I worry about is, is so much different to you. And I think that's because when you run a business, you get – Batted. 100%. The first two years, I feel like you get smacked with a baseball bat. You get back up again. Then someone comes in. You get six guys that punch the shit out of you. And it's just you're getting back up and up and up. And then you just get resilience from that. Yeah. Where so you said there that money is one of the biggest things to build this product to a point where it's like big enough to market to the big guys. Yeah. Resilience is a part of that because like there are points where maybe cash flow might be negative and money might be feeling like it's not as in abundance yeah yeah how do you start to get that thought process of we'll still get the fuck back up so yeah the money one is tough when that when that gets low mm. i'm not gonna lie that's when you, you've got to be get you've got to have that why why am i building this brand why am i pushing so hard because if it's just about money it's really easy to just pivot and do something else mm. and look and go oh, okay there's money over there to be made and be Maybe an, I'll be an investment banker. Like Yeah, yeah, I'll just go into finance. Yeah. Like, yeah, be an investment banker or join another business or so I think it's like, why am I creating this? Um for Emperor, the main driver was I want to show people that you can go to a public school, you can build a successful brand, you don't have to come from a rich family, you can literally be a nobody, build yourself up on social media, hustle, build a brand from nothing. And be and and do your best to become successful. Damn. That was my driver. Even though barely anyone was watching, I was like, there might be three people that watch this journey and go, far out, I'll give that a crack. I that spoke, was my driver. And I spoke to someone from school. He actually came in here the other day and he just said, I've got no idea why, but I'm so invested in this process. And those words for me were like more fulfilling than any dollar that has hit my account in the last five years. Really? Yeah. Do you find you're not motiv so you're motivated by for the process for me it's more so i think it's a i've now i used to do things to prove to, things to this teacher that said i'd be nothing now yeah. i feel like i'm proving to myself where i'm like because i went through a big stage of like depression and anxiety where i thought fuck i am either not going to get through this in business or i'm just not going to be here i'll be honest right yeah, yeah that yeah, was where yeah. i was yeah. at i was like fuck now it's like every challenge that i get there i'm like okay i'm proving this because i didn't think it could actually happen and it is and I'm in this thought process, well, if I think it, if I didn't think it could happen, how many other people didn't think it could happen? But how many other people also actually think it will? Like yeah. this dude that came in, he was from my school. Haven't, we haven't really spoken in a long time. And he just literally said, he goes like, man, I'm so invested in this process because what we're doing here is very, very different to the normal model with like a gym. We aren't opening to the public. Yeah. And it's, it's fucking unheard of, right? We're not even open to our clients. It's like, it's unheard of. So you just purely film the content here for all the modules is it like, what's the plan? Is it workouts? So like, it's for, essentially, we're going to use this as a place to leverage Instagram, TikTok and, and YouTube. Yeah. Right. It allows us to provide a better product to our current clients online. The people that come to us for our skill set, not our capacity to train them in person. Yeah, right? yeah. Okay. So when a client asks a question, we can send them a video that's specifically you know, filmed for them in the gym and go, cool, this is what we do. Right. yeah yeah here's here's the answer right we're also going to use the space to run like workshops where my big vision with this space is to improve this the industry standard across the board and unfortunately in in our industry is there's not many coaches not many pts that really know one how to run a business and two how to then apply that business knowledge to actually providing skill set providing value yeah. so we're going to try and cross populate that by running seminars here that tailor to both right so the, the generating of revenue will come through directly from the space from like seminars, workshops, and so on, but it's not consistent reoccurring revenue from a membership basis. Yeah, yeah, okay. So like, it's a very different model. And to hear someone say like, I'm so invested, but not in a negative way. Like the way he said it, and again, Tone says everything. The way he said yeah. that is like, I'm surprised, I'm excited, and I wanna see where it goes. Because yeah. like, I feel like when anytime you, in any business, and this probably goes for product too, like, if you can challenge the status quo a little bit, it gets eyes. 
gets attention. It does. And attention is the biggest portion. Like I would actually challenge you and say, money is not the biggest end, process to, to build a brand. It's attention. How, 100% How now. you get that is maybe money, but it may be a million different ways. Yeah. I think now it's, it's social attention. It's completely changed. Because there's so much potential. And you look at these TikTokers, the audience on them. I've got two mates that have just blown up on TikTok. They've got 1.4 million followers. Like they are brands. Was, was it intentional? I wouldn't. Because I feel like a lot of TikTok success is accident. So this, I wouldn't say now it's super strategic. Yeah, but initial blow up. But initial blow up was a surprise. Yeah. It blew up. It was just the right content, the right time. Yeah. Um, it was super funny, genuine. And then they blew up and now they've got Optus. They've got all of these different companies that want to work with them. And they're like, we don't know how we want to work with you yet, but we know we want to work with you at some capacity. However, we structure it because of your reach and your attention. And it's not even about revenue. It's just, we know we can get a heap of attention and a massive audience from that. We don't even know how we're going to do it yet or how we structure the deal. Just know there's a contract there ready to go. Yeah. It's social awareness, really. Like it's yeah. like, it's, short-term sacrifice, long-term gain kind of thing. Like, okay, cool. I have no idea how this is going to influence my revenue now, but partnering with Telstra will 100% influence revenue positively at some yeah. point. Yeah, it absolutely. And now I think um, we're, even when you look at the big retailers, if you've got a lot of uh, attention, you've got a big following, it's a genuine audience that's engaged, you can go to any retailer and say, hey, I want to create a brand. They will build that brand for you and just attach it to your name yeah. and just go, we've got this collab going on. And they know it'll blow up because as soon as that person posts, it's 500K in revenue, then there's a million the next day. And then they can keep building upon that. So now I don't even, I think personal brand is the most powerful thing you can have, which is why I'm like, I need to get my ass onto TikTok and, yeah. and do, do what and my I, clients are doing. You, you know? and I are a very similar ballpark because I remember, I think you put up on your stories a couple of days ago or a week or so ago where you're like, I'm looking for a videographer to follow me around, do the things. It's like, yeah. yo documenting your process. And that's why I ask, like what builds Lux? What what got you to the point where you had the resilience to it? Because like we weren't aware of the process needing to be documented when we were building it. Right? Yeah, and that's like my biggest regret about Emperor is not having a camera there. Because when you look at Christian Guzman for like Alpha Elite, Randall Pitch with Live Fit, all of those brands. Even Gary V, man. Oh, and Gary V. I mean, that's just another level. It's just like, like documenting everything. Yeah. The, because people, I, this is where building personal brand. And this is where it's like kind of plays into the thought process of people buying people before they buy anything else. Mm -hmm. Like without that documentation process, people don't, people buy, what I'm trying to say is people buy into the process more than they buy into the fucking outcome. Yeah. Right? yeah which absolutely. is, which is weird because like, if you look at any other sales process, right. Everyone sells the outcome, right? Cause even like, even you guys, when it looks, when you were looking at marketing emperor, it's like you were selling the high end model, in the high-end clothing, if you wear the clothing, you're going to look like the model, right? Yeah. You're, you're not always, you're not ever selling the process. You're always selling the outcome. It's like yeah, you feel right. empowered, right. feel good, feel amazing, right? You look at Qantas, they don't sell you the flight. They sell you the destination. It's very simple when it comes to marketing. Like yeah. what we do, we sell the weight loss, not the track the calories, burn the fat, do the workouts. We sell the fucking outcome. Yeah. Whereas I think now when it comes to personal brand, it's heavily shifted. People buy the process. People and they're more invested. Fuck, yeah, and they don't give a fuck about whether you've made a hundred grand or a million. Like if you show them the process of making every dollar, people are like, fuck, this guy's awesome. Yeah, and I think that builds the respect too because they see behind the scenes of what's going on and how hard you're working. And and I think I used to just, I had this thing in my head that I was like, I can only show the polished part of my life and when things are, uh, you know, the good outcomes, the positive outcomes, the wins, because I have to look like I'm in control. I have to look like I know what I'm doing. If I don't show people that I know what I'm doing, they won't do business with me. Mm -hmm. When really, when I started a YouTube channel, which I deleted because I couldn't take a certain amount of hate back then because I wasn't just wasn't ready for it. Yep. I deleted it. But when I showed that, it's like I built a whole, in, my Instagram following has dropped ever since I deleted that channel because it showed the raw side of the business and people saw what was involved and um, us driving around in my Volkswagen Golf at the time, filming content like crazily, um, with a bunch of models in studios that were small and people loved it. Dude, I can say from a consumer, that would be sick. Yeah. But then all these people, like at that time, it, it was when YouTube, you people just hated. Yeah. <laughs> people went through a two-year period of time where they just hated the world.
it just they, yeah, they just would hammer you with content uh, with the comments like hate comments and stuff. And at the time, I was like, I'm not ready for this. Yeah. I'm getting fucking battered here. Yeah. <laughs> and it wasn't even business stuff. It would be like based on the way you look or something like yeah, personal, super personal stuff. Shit. Super personal stuff, which now that I couldn't give a shit now, I'm 35. I want to build businesses and I've got, I know exactly where I want to go. And I don't care what anyone says. It's not going to derail me. But back then when I was younger, I was 28. Um, you're a little bit more insecure back then. You haven't got as much life experience. Like those comments can hit hard. But the, my biggest regret is dropping that YouTube channel so and not documenting. I'll put you on the spot then. Are there any things that you wish you had have shared? Some of the negatives. What are like some of the biggest negatives that you wish you had shared? Do you know what? I reckon in 2020, it would have been good to document how that went to shit when just losing $200,000 like that because, you know, um, stock rocked up damaged and the insurance company wouldn't take it. I wouldn't cover it. They were like, we don't cover that. And I was like, I paid for that. And they're like, we don't. Take us to court. So I was like, $200 in flames, $200,000 in flames, gone. No way of getting it back documenting that and then i feel like people would have been like let's do another range we'll support it do a pre-order do something like when i then eventually said that everyone reached out to me they're like bro why wouldn't you have just messaged us that we would have given you this amount of money that amount of money we would have invested this and that we could have there was ways around it yeah because like if you look at this as like a how like over how long was emperor i think six years i ran it for okay so over six years how many customers do you reckon you had oh. how long how big was your mailing list Mailing list was 45,000. Okay, cool. So if you had got every single person to give you two bucks. Yeah. It's like you covered half your loss. And this is learning, right? Yeah. Like you don't realize how loyal people were. When I sold the company, when you talk about getting depression and anxiety and stuff, when I sold the company, I got so much hate from customers, from people, from followers, just calling me a sellout you piece of shit. I had like death threats from retailers saying, you're dead. Like how could, now that you've sold that, we can't get access to that product. You've killed my business. You've killed this. We're going to fucking kill you. Fuck. And I was like, what the hell? I remember going to my girlfriend. I'm like, we're in the middle of a pandemic. We can't move. And like people are knocking on the door. Yeah. Death threats, bricks through fucking windows because I sold a company. Yeah. And that was like largely for the best of the company. It was for the best of the company and it was like a, you guys can take this to the next level. Yeah. It's like taking, like, I was listening to um, a podcast this morning of um, Layla and Alex Hormozy. I love those they, two. They're, they're amazing. But yep. Layla said something really, and it was fucking spot on, right? And it's like, it resonated with me, with me massively. It's like going from like a six-figure business to a seven-figure business is just adding multi-levels of, of management. Yeah. Right? And then going from three, f- th- sorry, from going from three million to like 10 million is then creating so many levels of management that all you are as the owner founder is the board that no one knows about. Yeah. Right. So like what you did with culture Kings was just adding in levels of management that had better skill set and more opportunity, more resources. Yeah. yeah like more, it, it, the, that alone, the resources they have, it's like you, you go from uh, a million in revenue with their resources to six in an instant mm. because you have, 17 people on your marketing team you have 12 content creators you have um now that they're invested in it they're going to triple the quantities they're going to you know there's all these different it's a resource thing but um after that i i just copped so much hate and i didn't realize the other you, you know just thinking at the time uh with those other retailers i realized but you think in your head they'll be okay they're big mm. Why does that retailer, you know, that the cuz every dollar counts, man. That's all it is. It's but like, that was stu- that was a bit naive. Yeah, it's like every dollar counts, right? Yeah. Like no matter how big you get, especially if you're like, I guess, quote unquote coming from humble beginnings, it's like you want to make more money, right? Yeah. You want to you want to be feel you want to feel more safe, but it's interesting when when we say like, you know, it was for the best of the company, right? Mm. Because one thing that like I find like what I do right with with my stuff is we actually have a profit share model, right? And the reason for it is because like one, it keeps them motivated, keeps them more more involved and keeps them around for longer to like put it simply. But they now care about the brand. They care about the business. They care about its progression, right? That technically reduces the size of the pie for me, right? As far as the size of the slice, right? Mm-hmm. But the size of the slice means nothing as, matter, as long as the piece of the pie starts to get bigger. Exactly. Yeah. Tech the, company like, model. Yeah. It's like the, the type of like the pie fucking grows. The piece might get smaller, but that's fine because as we all grow, everyone starts to benefit. And yep. you plug yourself into a company like 
Coach Kings or anything equivalent, it's like the pie quadruples in size overnight. Yeah, and yeah. Like, which means regardless of what you take or what your take home is, it's like the company's ability to grow. And if we look at what you're realistically selling, it's selling an outcome for people to feel you know, empowered, strong, popular, whatever it might be from clothing, whatever yeah. emotion is elicited from that, it now helps hundreds of thousands more people do that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And the tech companies all operate on the same model as you, mm. right? Everyone's got to share, everyone's got to stock, yep. uh, especially in the startup. So it's like a lot of the time, um, you know, with another company that I have equity in, their model is give everyone equity and when times get tough, everyone will dig deep. Everyone, everyone comes to the table and finds solutions. Like this company will not go down. Yep because we all have equity in this. Whereas if you're just a CEO with 100%, you've got a bunch of staff, as soon as they sense there's a chink in your armor and, and shit's going down, yeah. they will bounce. Not at all, or whose throat they're coming for. Yeah. It's, fu- it's on you, like fix the fucking problem, CEO. Yeah. Do the thing. Yeah, and you're the one getting all the money, so yeah. sort it out. Yeah. You're the one on the $400,000 paycheck. Make sure we've all got jobs. Whereas if everyone's got equity, I noticed in those tech companies, when time gets, times get tough, everyone digs in. And, and as you said, you might only have 33% of the company or whatever, and it's, the rest is distributed through all of the other team members or whatever. But if that 33% is 500 million, mm. why you're, does it matter? You're sitting pretty fucking good. You're sitting good. Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah. A, it's, it's something that I figured out real early, man. Like if you don't have staff that are motivated for the growth, especially in a service-based business, right, you can, you can get into this point where like you upskill the staff, you upskill their ability and then they go, all right, I'm going to do my thing. It's like, well, yeah. I won't do that. So I want you to stay. I want you to be involved. I want you to be a part of the family, part of the process. So that's what that's the way we're going to do it. Yeah. Because if, yeah, if I treated this as a model, it's smart. like, cool, you just get paid, right? By default, if they hang around me for long enough, they'll learn how to work with people. By default, they'll work, how to, work out how to you know improve people's processes as far as nutrition and training. And that's all a default model that if they spend enough time in the business, they would be capable to go run their own to a lesser standard, granted, but they could still go do it, yeah. right? So remove that remove that risk and just, cool, have a piece of the pie, stay. And then we all build it together. Because you know what, like building Emperor on my own was such a lonely experience. Yeah. Like now with Lux, I've made it my mission, build this with people. That's That's, that's interesting, man. Like talk to me about the feeling lonely in, in building a business it's just it's just hard it's hard work and when you don't have people to as many people like as it grew obviously there was more and more resources and people to bounce ideas yeah, more off and, stuff but it's different yeah. to growing it like, yeah but growing it on my own it's like every decision comes with so much weight because you're like if i if i get this wrong this is going to cost me a hundred thousand dollars and you're going through that on your own with your own money as you're scaling with no advice and the thing is as you get more sort of credibility, people start reaching out and helping you. But when you're seen as a startup with no experience, no one wants to help you. Yeah. They're just like, oh, I don't know what he's talking about. Um, there's no incentive for them to help you. I disagree. Really? Yeah. Okay. I feel like I feel like so many businesses, it comes back to the whole thought process of ego. Mm. No one asks for help. If you ask for help, what you're giving someone, right? Let's say you whether it be it has to be someone that's close. It's not I'm talking I'm not talking random investor. I'm talking yeah. someone that has the ability to help that you actually know. Yeah, if yeah. you ask for the help, what you're doing is giving them an opportunity to receive a gift. Like I get to help this person. That like I don't know about you, but every time you've helped someone, it feels good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. So you yeah, ask totally. for help. You give someone an opportunity to receive a gift, and no one, no one is going to say no to a gift. I'm like, well, if I can help you, I'm going to help you. Right. It's law yeah. of reciprocity, though, because if they help you, they're going to accept expect something back. Yeah. So I feel like yeah. business owners need to start getting used to asking for help, even in the startup phase, and just swallow the, swallow the pride and know that, yeah. You asking for help puts you in a position of weakness, but that's okay. Yeah. And most people don't really see it as weakness. And that's with Lux. I was like, I took a lot of lessons from EA around that, not asking for help because I was obsessed with always looking like I was in control. Yeah. Like I, ha- I can't ask for help because people will see that as a weakness. I think that's common across every business owner that's somewhat successful. They're scared of asking. They're scared of metrics, man. They're scared of what people perceive them as. Yeah. Yeah. And then I found with Lux, like, you know, the my... I would say mentors and resources are quadrupled now with this business. Mm-hmm. And the amount of people that are invested in the success of it is quadrupled to EA because people are like, well, um, 
we're invested in this part of it and we want to see that succeed and we can help here and we can bring in all these other people to help and hey you need to make sure the finances are right there so we can get investment here so don't worry about paying for an account and use our analyst instead yep use this person instead that you get access to all of these pools and i thought man if i'd have done that in 2015 imagine what i could have built back then yeah but I didn't know it at the time and I was doing the best I could with the resources and knowledge I had available. And it took, to you, took you to where you are now. So like, yeah. have you, had you had have known that then you'd be in a different place and maybe not learned the stuff that you needed to to get here. So yeah. it's, it's a catch 22. Let's, um, yeah. let's kind of map this out a little bit for people at home. Like obviously running and owning a market, marketing agency, in your opinion, if you were to launch new products tomorrow, what would be the non-negotiables? What would be the things they should build into their process or their product? Yeah, so I feel like now the first thing I would do would co- be 100% committed to creating content, showing the process. So if I started tomorrow, I would document the designing of the T-shirts, um, the process, the manufacturing process, negotiating with the manufacturers on even, you know, just the, just the small details there. I'd show people how many manufacturers I've got quotes from, those sort of things. Um, show the design process. I'd show the samples coming in, get people hyped on those put them on all over TikTok. I'd make TikTok my number one priority. And I'd showcase all the samples and stuff beforehand. Previously, I was like, I'm not doing that because someone will rip off the designs. I wouldn't give a shit about that now. I'd just concentrate on building pre-hot before the release, document all of that process and and just et- the ups and downs, everything. Just raw on TikTok, number one, and build up um, an audience there around the brand. Um, really be really clear on... Um, the messaging around the brand, like why, the why, what it stands for, um, why I'm why I'm creating that brand in the first place, um, why it's different from others, what's the point of difference, how am I better, why is it, what what does this support? I'd attach something to it as well. Like now, even I'd attach some sort of charitable section to it, and not just to be a do gooder, because I feel like that then attaches so much more purpose to it. So your drive isn't just going to be flat money, revenue, profit. It's like we need to make this work because we need to contribute to these five causes, men's mental health, suicide prevention. Um, uh, Regardless of whatever it, what it is, it needs to mean something to you and your brand. Your brand. Yeah, yeah. Like don't just pick a thing. Pick yep. a thing that aligns with the brand and the vision. Yeah, exactly. And now knowing, um, you know, how hard it is to build a business and what you go through and, you know, th- those two causes I would definitely support straight away and attach the brand to that just because I feel like it's so important at the moment, especially after the last two years. When I speak to most people, especially most men, they're they're carrying some really strong wounds from the last two years. Yeah, likewise. Definitely something I can um Yeah. I've had some pretty big conversations with friends, close and clients that are just like, Yeah, okay. Yeah. It's something that needs to be paid attention to, definitely. Yeah. And what you guys are building here with fitness, I think the the best way to to get over any of that is to work out, is to be active, is to keep moving. And I think like gym, that that for me, I'll put it on maintenance mode at the moment while I'm building a business, which is Alex Hormozy style. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I'm definitely going to focus on that towards the, you know, the next half of the year. Yeah, just do it in seasons, 100%. It's yeah. Like, you know, you have your seasons where you focus on this, seasons when you focus on another thing and it's necessary. It gives like, I feel like, as entrepreneurs, as business owners, we have um, very much ADD. We like have a million different thought processes going on. And the better we can actually start to appropriately distract ourselves from the ones that are somewhat destructive, right? Or distractive, probably a better better way to put it, mm-hmm. right? So for me, like I'm the same, like training and food is one of the things that's taken a huge back burner whilst all of this has been set up. It's like, because had I been 100% there, I wouldn't be 100% somewhere else. Yeah. And it's like, sometimes you just got to accept that there's, there's seasons to it, but if we were to, so you said TikTok. Yeah, right? TikTok TikTok's huge. Yep. Um, at what point do people, should people start pumping money into marketing? I think once once you've tested the product, you've got feedback on the product, you see if it's generating hype, you see if there's a need for it. Um, you know, for example, if you're like starting like I did with EA and you, you're creating t-shirts for guys that are taller, more active bodies, they can't get things that fit, put it out there, see if people want it, if people like it and it starts generating hype. I'd probably even organically put out like a pre-order, mm-hmm. see see the interest there, see if people are willing to put their money up to support the brand. And then after that, I would then invest dollar amounts into the advertising. That's that's I'm talking about someone that doesn't have a huge budget to start. Yep. And you're 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 using your nine to five income to fund a brand. You probably don't have as much experience in it. Mm-hmm. That's that's how I would start. 
TikTok number one? Because I've seen like kids um, that are 17 blow up gym labels. Yeah. Just on TikTok. Yeah. Just showing, nice. designing the hoodies, showing the samples coming in, then showing them pack orders, showing them pack, they show themselves packing the pre-orders. Yeah. And it blows up. And, and you're not talking like five grand a month in revenue. Some of these kids are making 20, 30, 50. We have um, a young guy that started uh, like a basic activewear label. And he is, we started him on a TikTok strategy because he was low budget. He was straight out of school. He's just 18. And now he's doing about 35K a month in revenue. And he's 18. Insane. So that is your sign for everyone at home. Go go get the fuck on TikTok. And yeah. Everything. yeah. So at what point, I would assume, like, correct me if I'm wrong here, but like when it comes to marketing, put some money behind it, test it. And once you see a result start to escalate by percentages of return. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think so. Like, every dollar will be reinvested back in. Mm-hmm. So so say if you, you put 500 in and you're only making 600 back or whatever, um, you obviously have to have a reserve to make that work. Yep. But yeah, go on feedback, right? See if there's a need for it and a demand for it and see if people are willing to put their cash up. Because you know, you know there's a lot of people that say, I support this business, but when it comes to putting their money up, are they going to buy that over another brand? Yeah. You need to test that first, test if there is a demand and then put put money into it. My thing would be if you have money, put money into it straight away. Yep. Just spread it out there. Distribution. Yeah. Get your content right. Get your ads right. Get the messaging right. Put money behind it straight away. But if you have a low budget, TikTok's the only way you're going to get that organic reach. My, I guess my summary of that as well would be I probably have a little bit more of a, I don't know, direct approach to what a lot of people would have here. I'm someone that my time is valuable. I'm someone that I don't want to spend the time learning the skill set of marketing. So if you have the budget, go get an agency. Like as much as, and this isn't just me trying to pump you, but it's just in general, I think like people undervalue how much time it's spent doing yeah. marketing and how much time it's spent to actually learn it as a skill set. And the way I look at this is if the, all the time, I've got no doubt that I could learn it eventually. It would take me a fuck ton of time, but all the time that could go into learning that is time wasted in actually growing the business and where I'm good. Mm. So like know your strengths and if marketing is not a strength, find someone who has that strength and move forward there. It's the reason most 99% of brands fail yeah. is because the marketing's wrong and you're competing against some people that have got it really dialed. They've re- got their marketing really dialed and they are taking huge chunks of the market. So if your marketing's not right, especially when you're a startup, you're finished. So it's exactly what you said. I got asked, my NLP coach was like, what, do you, what does Lux do? And I'm like, it solves pain and time mm-hmm. for businesses. It gives business owners more time and it saves them a lot of pain and stress of going through, why aren't these creatives working? Why is everything tanking? What's our messaging? They don't know. Whereas we can take a look at it, find out, create their messaging for that brand really quick, create the brand purpose really quick, tell them this needs to be fixed, that needs to be fixed. Oh, I don't have time. We'll do it then. Okay, do it. Yeah. That's what we do. Can confirm. You yeah, yeah. And like those that. times where, because you're running this. Yeah. You're, you're running two businesses and you were like, dude, just do the creative. Yeah, we just sent you like one of everything. It was like, do it. Like, kind yeah. of don't have time. Yeah, don't have time. And that's what we do with a lot of agencies. If you were to say, we, they, they would make you go out and do that. It's like they want you to bring all of the creatives to them and then they just sit there in their little warm office, put, the, put all of your hard work into these ads, set up some audience targeting and set and forget. It's like, man, it's the simplest business model in the world, but if you can do it faster, easier and so on, like you, what you're selling time and, and lack of pain are the two most valuable commodities in the world. Yeah. Like if you give someone back time and save them pain, like fuck. Yeah. If someone could tell me that I could save you all the time that you spend on doing the thing you hate and that's causing you the most stress and pain, I would pay all the money in my fucking account. Yeah. Like solve yeah. the problem, off you go. Yeah. And like the ability to do that, and I feel like most agencies do take that approach where it's just like, cool, let me plug all of your stuff in and go. What that means is it's going to take, what, maybe 30 days to do a testing cycle and figure out what's going on, where it's all working, get the content and so on. So your turnaround time is like, what, 30 to 35 days to actually get a result. Yeah. Whereas you guys can get it done, filmed and recorded, posted and sent within, what, 48 hours, 70, 72 hours? Yeah, yeah, quick. Like we, because we have access to so many influencers and content creators, if you send us a box, mm. we'll get stuff filmed in 48 hours. You send it across to you for approval. Mm-hmm. Do you like this? everything looks straight bang into the ads and then we'll monitor that and you'll have someone watching it every day like we've evolved a lot even just in the last couple of months just with all of our influencer connections and just with the way everything's changed yeah so we'll do it all you can literally sit there and just i'm focusing on production and we'll handle the rest yeah and i i designed it that way because all of my pain points with ea 
Yeah. I want a marketing agency. Do everything for us and then hand it to us. I'm like, what am I using you for? Well, it's creating a user-friendly experience. You were the yeah. user. You yeah. were once the business owner that hated all the, all the bullshit of like building an apparel business. Yeah, yeah. So it's like, I guess like for, from, from a client's perspective, it's like you guys have solved the problem of creating a perfect user experience that is coming from user experience. Yeah, yeah. It's all of my pain points and everything that gave me pain running a clothing brand. I've tried to fix all of that pain and all of that stress, create an, like an agency offering where you can, if you want to, you can just come to us and say, just do it all. If you've got the budget, let's go. Yeah, yeah. Just create all the creatives, do it, do it all. Um, but if you want to be involved in other parts, you can. Yeah, awesome, man. If you want to give everyone a little bit of a plug where you are, what you can do and where to find you, we'll cap it off there. And one last thing is any other, anything that you would like to say to someone starting a business in apparel or starting a marketing agency, where would you start? Uh, I would start by most people, the, the hardest thing is they, they don't start. So I'd say just take the, the first step, whether it's creating a brand logo, whether it's setting up the Instagram page, whether it's doing the first design, then submitting that to a manufacturer. The, hardest, the, the biggest thing I see is everyone's got these ideas, but they don't even take the first step. They don't even design that logo. And you know, in Atomic Habits, they're just like, if you want to start the gym, just do two minutes. Make it part of your identity first. So just start the logo first. Start, do the first design, put it on a CAD, put it on a drawing, sketch it, whatever it is. And then once you've got that done, then look for a manufacturer. Yep. And if you're starting a marketing agency, don't even think about it. I got it covered. <laughs> <laughs> we will, they will squash you. <laughs> I'll come at you aggressively. <laughs> And I will say he's like seven foot tall, so he'll fucking scare you. Um, all right, man, where can people find you? And um, just give everyone a little bit of recap of what you do. Uh, yeah, so on Instagram, it's under Zane Marshall. And I've just started a TikTok under Zanos, which is my middle name. Uh, my, not my middle name, my nickname. I was going to say, if your middle name is Zane, <laughs> if your name is Zane Zanos, I'm going to fucking that's, cry. <laughs> that's my uh, nickname that everyone calls me. So I've just started that TikTok account on Instagram. It's Zane Marshall. Yep. And um, basically, yeah, I'm, at the moment I'm helping brands, young people, entrepreneurs build their brands, scale their brands rapidly. And um, I want to put as many Australian brands on the map at the moment so that we stop sending our money overseas and building American companies and UK companies and European ones. Awesome. Blow up the Australian brands and keep the money here. We need it. Excellent, man. Thank you for coming on. It's been a pleasure. And um, I'd love to get you back on soon and we'll talk more into the depths of like marketing and all the other stuff that comes from the next uh, six to 12 months. But Thanks again, on, Thanks for having me. Thank you. Appreciate it we'll so much. talk soon. It's only worth it if you work for it. I won't stop till they hear me now. I won't stop till I wear the crown.